Smart specialization strategies are the latest flagship initiative of the European Commission, and it is bringing more than 200 regions from the EU and beyond to promote innovation and technological developments across key sectors, and at the same time, build long-term competitiveness in every region of Europe. This is a novel approach to innovation policy making, which is radically changing the way regional authorities engage with local industries and other innovation stakeholders, altogether creating and reinforcing innovation. But what exactly is smart specialization? And why should we care? Hi, my name is Hernán Pajar. I'm an innovation consultant at Babel Smart Cities. And in this video, I will walk you through some of the basic concepts behind smart specialization so that we can understand how to benefit from it. So first things first, what is smart specialization? When we talk about smart specialization, we talk about fostering structural transformations within existing industries. And this is done through the discovery of new areas of opportunity and the concentration of regional resources around them. Examples of such transformations could be industries that are transitioning to new domains dictated by ongoing research efforts, or industries diversifying at the intersection of established and new sectors where potential synergies may exist. Also lagging industries looking at modernizing through digitalization or the adoption of new technologies, or even establishing entirely new areas of innovation. Whatever the process is, the goal is to support this transformation by building local innovation capacity into the specific priority areas through targeted programs, projects, and initiatives. And most importantly, to ensure spillover effects in all sectors throughout the region. One such example is the Portuguese Algarve region, where digitalizing the tourism offer has become a priority, or the Swiss region of Fribourg, which has charted a definitive path towards the bioeconomy. Even territories outside of the EU, such as FACS in Tunisia, where specialization in medical technologies is being explored. Many other regions are still turning to smart specialization. For example, Ireland's southern region, which is currently looking at potential areas of opportunity for its local industries. When we refer to a smart specialization area, we are not just talking about sectors alone, but about the transformation of these sectors. So let's look at what isn't a smart specialization area and what could be a much better way to approach it. For example, tourism in an alpine region cannot be a smart specialization area just because of its economic importance. Instead, if we look at ICT developments to transform tourism services, and thereby enrich the experience of tourists, then we can talk about an area of specialization, which is emerging from the synergies between these two sectors, ICT and tourism. Another example is a key sector, such as the fishery and canning industry in Galicia, Spain, which cannot be considered an area of specialization. But for example, if we combine university research in bioengineering with some tech solutions from startups, to cater for very proactive local fisheries, then we can create new opportunities for innovation. In this case, we have three sectors, fisheries, bioengineering, and ICT. Finally, even traditional sectors such as agri-food or construction and materials can find areas of specialization, just as Freiburg's vision towards bioeconomy, where a supply of bio-based products and materials for key production industries is being developed. So we can say that a smart specialization area has two components. One, the region's key sectors, and two, a direction of change. In this sense, a smart specialization area should reflect the specific capabilities, potentials, and opportunities of the region, based on a profound understanding of the local industries. Moreover, and this is what is new about this approach, the direction of change should be in line with global macro trends, societal challenges, etc. It is therefore necessary not only to look inwards towards the regional strengths, but also to look outwards and benchmark those strengths against the global competitive landscape. Finally, and more importantly, they are not static.
it involves the agglomeration and clustering of existing industries around these areas through a dynamic business-led process called the entrepreneurial discovery process. And this is one of the key concepts of smart specialization. The entrepreneurial discovery process can be seen as the reconfiguration of all these disparate and fragmented regional strengths and potentials in order to create a launching pad for local industries to compete successfully in the future knowledge economy. As such, the EDP involves the co-development of a transformation roadmap, translating high potential areas of specialization into action with a combination of projects, initiatives, and programs aimed at supporting the specific areas in which the region can expect to excel, and thus build a unique competitive advantage. This is not an easy task, as it involves a highly collaborative process of exploration, experimentations, and constant learning, which feels more like being an entrepreneur building new ventures, and hence the name. The EDP must be driven by the local industry, and spearheaded by visionary leaders and forerunners in the local ecosystem. This is critical to, create, to creating traction and gaining momentum. Research, academia, and higher education institutions also play a key role, although not as central. Entrepreneurship means business, and business means commercialization. Therefore, while universities and research institutions can feed the process with new knowledge and technological developments, companies are definitely the best positioned to bring these innovations to the market. Finally, public authorities at the different government levels, local, regional or national, must have an enabling role, that is, ensuring that the necessary conditions for EDP are in place. Now that we have covered the concept of smart specialization areas of specialization and the entrepreneurial discovery process, it's time to talk about the smart specialization strategy itself. And let's start by asking, how are they different from traditional approaches? On the one hand, we have horizontal strategies. They are generic in nature, have of course a horizontal logic and neutral or sector agnostic interventions. That means, programs supporting capacity building for research and innovation without having a particular sector in mind. It can be, for instance, a part of funding to support any research activity or the promotion of STEM skills to meet industry's rising demand. On the other hand, we have vertical strategies, which are specific in nature, have a vertical logic and targeted interventions. That is, program supporting capacity building, but this time focused on particular transformation in particular industries. We will look at some examples of this next. But for now, we can realize that both types of strategies have the same goal in common, building innovation capabilities, which means that rather than conflictive or mutually exclusive alternative, they are in fact complementary. So how can we visualize smart specialization strategies and how can they work together with other approaches? I like to think of it as follows. Horizontal strategies are meant to create a fertile ground with the necessary conditions for innovation to flourish. They support large sectors, high tech clusters and low tech SMEs all together at a horizontal sectoral level. On top of that, we have smart specialization strategies discovering high potential activities happening within these industries and pushing them to converge in future strategic areas for the region to solidify its future competitive advantage. Regarding the areas of activities, it is important to be careful and strike a balance in the level of granularity, not too broad so that vertical strategies lose effectiveness and its meaning, and not too narrow so that only few organizations can benefit. The smart specialization strategy will then consist of a diverse policy mix of programs and mechanisms to support the transformation process. This may include a portfolio of public-private R&D projects, knowledge and dissemination or technology transfer, public procurement of innovation, and specialized training, services, and support infrastructure.
Finally, let's look at how smart specialization strategies can be implemented. It is a relatively lean three-step process, which is characterized by being dynamic, iterative, and evidence-based. First step is identifying potential areas of specialization and prioritize them based on robust evidence. Here is where in-depth knowledge of the local economy comes into play. To do so, regional authorities can perform several, often statistical analysis, complemented with an extensive stakeholder consultation. This last part is crucial, as top-down analysis alone can easily exclude high potential areas. So the main output of this stage can be seen as an indicative map pointing out where to look for high potential activities. This map provides a basis and a good starting point to guide the next stage, the entrepreneurial discovery process. At the second step, EDP comes into play to co-develop the transformation roadmap, with the businesses in the lead, of course, putting in place a clear action plan for all the projects, initiatives, and programs to implement in the next months and years. The final step is the implementation of the action plan, and most importantly, monitoring. The S3 methodology emphasizes the importance of monitoring and proposes a number of distinct indicators or KPIs in addition to the more traditional economic indicators. The data gathered through monitoring can serve to make informed decisions, improve existing programs, and even change course. Yes, changing course is possible within the S3 framework, as this is a highly iterative process. And as said before, the specialization areas are never set in stone or for eternity. The S3 is a process of constant discovery. This, of course, implies a certain element of uncertainty that traditional policies do not usually allow for. And well, here's where gathering strong evidence becomes essential to minimize risk. Now, let's look at some examples of smart specialization areas. These two French regions, the Aquitaine region and the Pays de la Loire, have both defined their specialization areas based on their local strengths. As you can see from the lists, both regions have moved away from the country's more strategic sectors, color-coded on the right-hand side, and moved towards more specific and concrete areas of specialization, that can also be cross-cutting, as we can see in some cases with the double color boxes. It is important to highlight that there is not a good or a bad number of areas for a region to have. This depends entirely on the local conditions and also on the level of diversification of the local economy. Similarly, there is not a good or bad level of specificity for the areas. We can have very specific areas, such as the one at the top of the list of for Aquitaine, smart delivery of active ingredients for well-being and health, or more broad ones such as future therapies and health for Pays de la Loire, even though both belong to the same sectors, health. This depends also on, let's call it, the level of readiness of the local industries to pursue a very niche area. Sometimes, some for some regions, it's more productive to define a slightly broader area and refine it later on through the EDP as opportunities emerge. Let's look at another example. Do you remember the Freiburg region in their pursuit of the bioeconomy? Well, here we can see the transformation roadmap which includes a list of activities that range from R&D, diffusion, public procurement, training, etc. They mapped these activities based on their potential to 1. build capacities and 2. to create new opportunities. Here, activities in close proximity could exploit synergies and represent an even greater potential to support the transformation. Therefore, these kind of clustered activities should be prioritized. To conclude this presentation, I would like to answer a key question. Why do smart specialization strategies matter? First of all, globalization and digitalization are trends that are making the current marketplace highly competitive. 
which in turn has made innovation a matter of business survival rather than just a strategy to compete better. And even more so, innovation has become important to build resilience to disruptive events such as the recent pandemic. In this landscape, businesses, cities, and regions are competing less with their national peers and more with their counterparts overseas, often against big players. Smaller players may not be in an ideal position to generate sufficient R&D and, cap and innovation capabilities, and to do so fast enough to keep up with increasingly changing market demands. Therefore, more and more organizations are turning to open innovation models to generate this critical mass. And to be successful, there is a need to tap into both local and regional strengths by mobilizing and concentrating knowledge, assets, and capacity to accelerate growth. Thank you very much for watching this video. I hope you find it very useful to know a little bit more about what regional authorities are really doing to promote innovation. Please feel free to contact me for any questions or any further information, or even if you want to share your own experiences with innovation or smart specialization strategies. Thank you again and goodbye.